I'm Adriana Fetter. I'm a psychiatrist at Mount Sinai in New York City. And I'm um, so uh, given the ongoing um, war in the Ukraine, it's of course very pertinent to talk about treatments for depression and for PTSD. I do want to say that the studies that were conducted um, and most of the clinical experience it does not come from a, a place where there's an ongoing war. So whenever um, I, um, you know, I might make some comments about how that might um, modify uh, some of these um, applications of, of this treatment. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, I have a disclosure. I am named co-inventor with Dennis Charney on uh, patents related to the treatment of ketamine for PTSD. Um, briefly, um, we know that glutamate is a, the, it's the most common, uh, the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It modulates stress responses. We know from animal studies there are abnormalities in glutamatergic function. And these abnormalities are thought to be a part of the pathophysiology of PTSD. And animal studies have shown that repeated chronic stress over a few weeks is associated with atrophy of the dendrites, the connections between the neurons in the hippocampus and the frontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex. And that is uh, because the, of the synaptic atrophy, there's impaired connection, connectivity in these glutamatergic, glutamatergic synapses, which are important for emotion regulation in the brain and many other functions. Now, uh, ketamine is um, a non-competitive NMDA glutamate receptor antagonist. So it's a subtype of a glutamate receptor. And it was shown in um, animals that one administration to rodents um, of a single dose of ketamine very rapidly, uh, who had been subjected to chronic stress before and had synaptic atrophy, rapidly reversed the synaptic atrophy and the dendrites of layer five pyramidal neurons. So this demonstrated that one single administration of ketamine can reverse this abnormal connectivity patterns in key brain region, regions for stress responses to stress. Now, we started, I started doing uh, studies on ketamine for PTSD with my mentor, Dennis Charney, who Eric Vermetten knows well, and he's a very uh, prominent researcher in, in trauma, PTSD, neuropsychopharmacology in general. And he and his colleagues had led the first studies of ketamine for treatment-resistant depression. So um, the first study, uh, for treatment-resistant depression was a small randomized controlled trial. It's not this one, but I wanted to say that one was published by Carlos Zorari uh, and colleagues in 2006. And it showed that a single ketamine infusion compared to a single saline infusion was associated with very rapid um, improvement in, PT in uh, depressive symptoms uh, which started within a few hours and it was uh, it, it peaked at 24 hours after the infusion. That was followed by several ketamine studies uh, also conducted by um, Dennis Charney and colleagues and including my colleague, um, Dr. James Murrow here at Mount Sinai. And the one I'm showing here is the first definitive um, randomized controlled trial, a two-site study between Mount Sinai in New York and the Baylor School of Medicine in Texas, which showed actually that a single ketamine infusion compared to a single double-blind, a single infusion of the psychoactive placebo medication midazolam, also short-acting, also mild, mind-altering, 
um, was a, was uh, that ketamine was superior. And this was actually in 73. Can you see my pointer? I'm not sure. Yes. So it was 73 patients with treatment resistant depression. And the randomization was two to one. So every two patients randomized to ketamine. One patient was randomized to midazolam. And it was the standard sub-anesthetic dose of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram administered intravenously over 40 minutes. And you can see that ketamine infusion was significantly superior to um, midazolam infusion. And the primary outcome was at 24 hours. Um, and these are the at least 50% response rates. And you can see day one, day two, day three, by the end of the week after a single infusion, day seven, um, you can see that, um, and in animal studies, the reversal of the dendritic atrophy also lasts for about seven days. You can already see that um, the response is starting to go away. So that's something that I'll talk about as well. And this is the um, what happened after a single infusion. The time to relapse, um, was, you know, on average, about seven to 10 days, people uh, started losing the response. Some people stayed better longer and some people still at the last follow-up were better, uh, you know, about a month later. So it's uh, in a minority of patients, it can last longer, but typically it lasts about a week uh, in depression. Now, before I mention this, I want to say, uh, oh, also in 2013, um, Maria Anhedrot, who is a colleague of Eric Vermetten's, and she's in the Netherlands. She's back in the Netherlands, has been for a long time, but she was a postdoctoral fellow here at Mount Sinai and together with Dennis Charney and also James Murrow later on, who joined later on, conducted an open label study, so not a randomized control trial, and this one was a six infusions of ketamine twice a week, uh, sorry, three times a week for two consecutive weeks. And so this was the first trial in treatment resistant depression of repeated dosing ketamine. And so, and the improvement lasted longer, as you can see. So if you give repeated infusions, People remain, uh, the people who respond, about two thirds of individuals have a, a response with treatment resistant depression, meaning that they did not respond to other antidepressant treatments. And some of these patients had also previously received electroconvulsive therapy, for example, but many had not. Um, and here, this is the primary outcome day. And here you can see that the median time to relapse is actually about two and a half weeks after the course, after, uh, you know, it would be here that they received the six infusions of ketamine and two weeks later is the primary outcome. And from that two week time point after they finish the six infusions, about people remain better for another two and a half weeks on average, and then most relapse. And so that's actually, now we know from, from this study and from other studies that have been done since, um, that uh, when you start repeat, when you receive a course of six infusions, that the patients who do respond, and in general is very rapid after the first or second infusion, they can remain better for about a month before on average they relapse. So again, if you stop giving ketamine, at some point, the majority of patients, the majority, will relapse. Now, at this time in the US, and I would be interested in the situation in the Ukraine, um, and maybe I'll ask when I, so that I can you know, present this, and then at the end, I, I will ask. Uh, in the US, ketamine is only FDA approved by the governing uh, body, the Food and Drug Administration, for anesthesia, as I believe is in the case in the Ukraine. However, and it is a controlled substance like benzodiazepines, like opioids, but it can be administered off-label. So 
uh, if there's enough research, um, uh, clinicians at the time, in fact, had established following these studies, uh, ketamine clinics where patients, this is not covered by insurance because it's not approved by the Food and Drug Administration. However, psychiatrists or sometimes working together with anesthesiologists, sometimes anesthesiologists alone can establish ketamine clinics. And in fact, there are many ketamine clinics where patients can go and if they can pay out of pocket for ketamine fusions, they get evaluated, they have treatment resistant depression. And over time, when we started doing our first PTSD study, they added PTSD to the indication. Now, many studies have come since then on review everything, but this is a summary. And most of them showed an improvement compared to either placebo, like saline, or midazolam. And, um, but that the effect is transient, as I showed before. And this is an interesting study, Singh et al. compared twice weekly dosing, the same standard dose, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, which is sub-anesthetic. An anesthetic dose begins that would be to give a patient anesthesia to put him to sleep for a surgery, or would be approximately two milligrams per kilogram and higher. So this is people don't typically fall asleep, administered intravenously over a course of 40 minutes. And so they randomized 68 patients to receive repeated infusions of either placebo or ketamine, and they compared twice a week ketamine here to three times a week. And the there was no, for treatment of this depression, it did equally well. So both doses were effective. Most common side effects that we see, by the way, I should add that is pretty benign, that in general, it, it doesn't lead to complications, but there are some fairly common side effects like headache, anxiety. Some people find it uncomfortable. Some people uh, have acute dissociative effects, but it's pleasant. Some people feel a little giggly, um, it, happy, or it depends. But commonly, people can have a headache, nausea, dizziness, and many people don't, uh, besides the, dis the dissociative acute dissociation is common to various degrees, and it goes away typically after like five, 10 minutes after the infusion is over, the 40 minute infusion, and dissociation is transient and it tends to diminish with repeated dosing. And then Janssen Pharmaceuticals in the US developed studies as ketamine, which is, you know, um, ketamine, like all molecules, has left sided and right sided molecules as ketamine is only the left-sided molecules, and the regular ketamine is called the racemic mixture, both right and left. And they showed, uh, they developed, you know, they did randomized controlled trials, and they showed uh, that it works for treatment-resistant depression. They studied it as an adjunctive uh, intranasally, and they called it, the brand name is Spravato, intranasally for treatment-resistant re uh, depression in addition to an oral antidepressant. So it's approved now in 2019 as an adjunct, intranasal adjunct, and people come in to clinics that are set up for this purpose. They get an assessment and they get monitored. It's not something they take home with them, but it starts twice a week for a month, and then it goes down to once a week, and then sometimes to lower frequency. But it also, just like ketamine, it has to continue to be given in order to prevent relapse or to continue the maintenance. And subsequently, more recently, it was approved in the United States, Spravato or intranasal esketamine for patients with treatment-resistant depression or, or depressive symptoms with acute suicidal ideation. And I'm not going to show the results, but there's since been studies or er, before showing that intravenous ketamine also rapidly reduces suicidal ideation in patients who are suicidal and depressed. So that's another indication of spravato. Now, there have been fewer studies of maintenance ketamine over time, not just, you know, over four weeks. And most of them are open trials, open label, or case series and case reports. Very few randomized controlled trials. And here you can see the numbers. Uh, and typically, most studies, 
They administer an initial short course with frequent administration, like twice a week for two weeks or three times a week for two weeks. And then they try to reduce the frequency, in some cases up to once a month. And in cases with IV ketamine, uh, and the doses range from 0.5 to one, one and a half, two is a bit high. Um, and some in ketamine clinics, they can continue. So in animals, it's been shown that once you go towards anesthetic doses, it, it doesn't have an effect. So it's important that it be a, a sub-anesthetic, but it's a range. And so um, some, you know, it's been shown to maintain improvements in some of these open label or case series, maintaining improvement of treatment, otherwise treatment resistant depression for over a year. And in some cases in maintenance doses given once a month. And there doesn't seem to be habituation or cognitive impairment over time that were not necessarily uh, associated with addiction. And then there was concern because people who are addicted to ketamine using in much higher doses and frequently, more frequently, I should say, not necessarily higher doses, there's been a number of people who develop serious renal, you know, uh, cystitis, for example, or urinary problems. But with this, administration clinically at sub-anesthetic doses and less frequently, it's very uncommon. I have seen an occasional patient develop temporarily urinary retention infrequently, uh, but it can happen. Now, in this context, when my uh, mentor and colleagues were doing uh, studies uh, of ketamine for PTSD, uh, I teamed up with uh, Dennis Charney to conduct the first study of a single infusion of ketamine for chronic PTSD. And this is important because it's not in the acute, shortly after acute trauma, but it's for chronic PTSD defined in the DSM of at least three months duration. So these studies involve individuals who have been traumatized at least three months ago. Many of them are the majority many years ago, but it does include individuals who were traumatized a few months ago. Um, and currently available treatments for PTSD don't help everyone. There's a significant proportion that either don't respond or respond partially. And then there's trauma-focused psychotherapies that have a lot of support, clinical and research support. However, sometimes they're difficult to tolerate so or, or it's difficult to find specialists who can administer these therapies. Um, and, and it's hard for patients to tolerate them. Uh, like uh, so that they can as be associated with uh, pretty high levels of dropout. And this is the first randomized control trial. Um, so actually this was our single infusion and we showed that it was superior to midazolam. There were 41 patients that were randomized about half, uh, you know, to receive ketamine, half midazolam, and it was a crossover study, but this is just a, an, um, one week, the first arm. And, and we, uh, we showed that it was superior at 24 hours. And this is primarily in civilians, the general population uh, with various kinds of trauma. This was then we went on to, um, I went on to lead the first uh, randomized controlled trial of repeated ketamine for PTSD. It was randomization only 15. It was a total uh, 30. Um, and, the, and the clinician administered um, a PTSD scale administered by a clinician over the past month, they had to have a score of 30 or over, and 30 or over is a few points into the moderate level of PTSD. On average, they had severe PTSD, and uh, six infusions three times a week uh, over two consecutive weeks, so typically, but not always, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then this was the primary outcome with a clinician administered PTSD scale. Here you can see the average age, uh, there were more women than men, and many with sexual assault or molestation, some of them in childhood, some of them as adults, uh, physical assault, an accident on fire, or fire too with combat exposure, and other, um, other traumas. So a range of traumas. And again, this was the first study to show not only rapid improvement, superior with ketamine than with midazolam, but also uh, that by two weeks, they were really significantly improved. And I'll show you how long they remained. So much superior with ketamine. So two thirds of those assigned to ketamine 
were at least 30% improved, which was our a priority, a priori definition of uh, improvement, significant clinical improvement based on other uh, publications. It's different from depression, at least 30% improved uh, compared to only 20% on the psychoactive placebo arm or medazolam, only 20% who were at least 30% improved. And like we had shown with a single infusion study, the improvement was seen across all subscales or cl symptom clusters, except here it approached significance in the arousal reactivity, but it didn't fully reach significance. We're not sure why, but perhaps because midazolam also can help with things. It's an anxiolytic, so it's a hard comparator, and it can help with sleep and things like that. So perhaps it helps. And patients, we gathered some testimonials as part of the, um, the, the clinical assessments, and they would say things like, uh, I don't feel my life is going to end anymore before I couldn't plan a future. And they noticed that they panicked much less after interacting with someone who had been uh, bothering them. Another patient said, I feel like a normal person. My brain no longer lets me envision or picture a thought of suicide. This was someone who was chronically suicidal. And her past trauma, when she thinks about it, doesn't make her feel weighed down. Um, and this other participant felt like she had energy and wanted to do things again, felt safer confronting feelings, and that they had accepted or could go past, move past the trauma. One thing I wanted to mention is the severity of PTSD. Again, 30 is a few points into the moderate range, but you see that on average, they were 40, and 40 is... 46 is severe and 47 plus is extreme PTSD. So very severe and chronic on average about 14 years in this study. Although some people, again, had trauma within the past year. And very similar to what um, Mariah and Hedro saw in the repeated open label ketamine for depression, the first one with three times a week over two consecutive weeks, is that about a month after the first infusion or 18 days or so, uh, about a month from the first infusion or 18 days from the primary outcome was the median time to relapse. So again, in PTSD, same thing. We need to continue to give ketamine, otherwise people relapse. Very briefly, my postdoc fellow, wonderful um, researcher, neuroimager and computational psychiatrist, Agnes Norbury, uh, we did neuroimaging in a subset of the 30 in about 10 and 10, 20, who had received ketamine versus midazolam. And the more the PTSD symptoms improved, the, the more there was an increase in ventromedial uh, frontal cortex to the amygdala, the, the key emotional region, and a circuitry of emotional regulation, an increase or reversal of connectivity problems. And what she showed also with directional analyses is that only in the ketamine group, while viewing, this was while viewing emotional faces, there was higher, greater top-down inhibition of the amygdala by the frontal cortex, only in the ketamine group. And in fact, at pre-infusion, those who had the lowest uh, top-down control, emotion regulation between these two regions from the top to the amygdala, were the ones who had showed better improvement on ketamine in PTSD. Very briefly, because I know I have to, uh, you know, give room to the other presenter. This was another study conducted at Yale and Texas, San Antonio, by our colleagues Chadi Abdallah and uh, John Crystal, who had John Crystal developed ketamine for depression together with Dennis Charney. And this was the first, a larger study in veterans who uh, it was less frequent, twice a week for four consecutive weeks, also intravenously, and saline, not midazolam. 54 got placebo, repeated placebo. 53 got low-dose ketamine, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram, or the standard dose of 0.5. Here, they didn't see improvement, no difference, except the higher dose, the standard dose, did a little bit better, at 24 hours and the other dose did a little bit better at 28 days. No difference overall. This was the 
PTSD checklist to self-report. This was the clinician administered the gold standard for DSM-5. It was not their primary outcome. Here in post hoc analyses, there was no difference overall between the three groups, but in post hoc analyses, for some reason, the low dose did better than the placebo. And here we see the depression. And for depression, now, yeah, all arms include improved. The placebo arm also improved. But the depression or MADRA scores were significantly reduced in all of them. And there was a difference. Uh, ketamine standard dose, the higher dose, did better at 24 hours and again at the end after four weeks. So it was a study that was overall a negative study for the most part. And I've talked to my colleague and we've looked at it and it could be due. It's we, I believe that in PTSD, the initial infusions at least, the course of infusions need to be more frequent. Because in the first study of a single infusion, we saw the median or mean time to relapse was a couple of days. So instead of twice a week, it is possible that three times a week in the initial course might be necessary. And also we know that veterans and military personnel, active duty soldiers, it is harder to treat PTSD. The last piece is that this was for individuals with who had failed at least one antidepressant medication, which was not the case. Other studies have shown good response, less controlled studies. This one is a comorbid pain and PTSD, and this one is a retrospective case series with S-ketamine. So very briefly, I wanna show finally two minutes and then I'll go. Uh, because of the relapse, we wondered, if we add, how can we maintain and keep these patients from re relapsing? So I've you know, talked many times with Eric as well, because ketamine has been shown to enhance fear extinction in animals, what about if we add an exposure-based therapy, which is thought to work through either reconsolidation, but also fear extinction, and since ketamine increases neuroplasticity temporarily, what if we start after a few infusions we add a trauma-focused therapy. One important thing is if you are under ketamine, receiving ketamine, there are studies in healthy humans from Yale and other places showing that if you bring up a bad memory or an aversive memory, if you are under the effect of ketamine, they can be made stronger. So you wouldn't want to do administer an exposure therapy during ketamine. But we just finished, we're actually in the last stages of assessment where we chose written exposure therapy because it's briefer, trauma-focused, it's more easily administered and scalable, much more easily trained, the therapist, and it's adding written exposure therapy to ketamine treatment for PTSD. And this therapy more and more uh, in studies led by the developers, Denise Sloan and Brian Marks, have shown non-inferiority, and now more recently in veterans, uh, compared to one of the standards, uh, uh, cognitive processing, processing therapy. It typically works more slowly, so that you can see baseline, this was once a week for five weeks, the sessions, so that by, you know, third, you know, at six weeks, not that much better, this is the CAPS, again, 36, a few points into the moderate scale, or almost severe, 37 is severe, by 12 weeks, you see on average a 10-point decrease because people, even after you finish the therapy here, people continue to expose themselves. So this is very briefly the design of our study. Patients got four infusions, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the following Monday. The next Tuesday, they start written exposure therapy over Zoom with a therapist that's trained and supervised actually by Denise Sloan. And then they get the last two infusions interleaved of the course of six, interleaved with the first wet sessions, and then the total of the, the rest, the three last wet sessions the next week. And then they're followed for up to 12 weeks and people who are still better after. So lots of different studies to conduct in the future, exciting, larger randomized controlled trials. Sorry to go over, uh, um, I'm very sorry. And I wanted to thank this is a, a village, uh, basically, the studies cannot be conducted um, um, in isolation. So thank you all for your attention.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adriana. That was a brilliant and, and wonderful ending. I, I was watching two minutes and it was three, four, five, but what you shared in the last couple of minutes was wonderful novel news that you haven't spoken about before. And it's really novel right. and it's it's really incentivizing. In 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 the time that you spoke, the attendance went up from like 40 to 73. So it's doubled. <laughs> I think people are sort of chatting to each other, like you you need to come here because Adriana Feder is talking. <laughs> So thank you. Thank well, you. I mean, I one thing I didn't say is that obviously there is some concern, and this is very important, that if in acutely traumatized people, there's concern that if you give ketamine the same day, like if somebody uh, in war is traumatized, there's a bomb that goes off, they're very anxious, and you give ketamine the same day, the next day, there used to be more concern that that could worsen or worsen the rate risk of PTSD. However, more recent studies have not, this has not panned out. There remains some concern, but I don't, uh, it's not as concerning as it used to be because the original studies that, uh, by, that showed by Schoenenberg were in motor vehicle accident survivors that were given ketamine in the ambulance ride and the comparator group, a lot of them received opioids, which can decrease the, the incidence of PTSD. So it is still concerning, but I wanted to say this in the context of Ukraine. So Anna, this is a question that probably is applicable to everybody. Uh, can we see the last photo of your presentation? Can you show that up? Can you bring that up again briefly? Yes, so sure. The question in the chat that somebody wanted to see it again. It was, uh, I think, Anna. Uh, I don't think this one or the previous, this one, right? The summary that, that they can either make it, make it. Yeah, so this, I mean, I'm sorry because I didn't have too much time, but the idea is that because it enhances extinction learning and also ketamine opens uh, an a window of increased neuroplasticity, even in patients with depression, there have been studies showing with cognitive behavioral therapy during that window, perhaps that can help. Now, some people now, and we are starting with my colleague, James Murrow, leading we're about to start in a, a controlled study of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, which I know is also practiced clinically, but hasn't been formally researched in a controlled trial, uh, mm -hmm. of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy in the room for depression in this case. Now here, because as I showed before, in healthy humans, ketamine can enhance the memory of negative, aversive memories we have to be very careful about what we do in this setting. And so the idea is sort of kind of similar perhaps with the MDMA assisted therapy with PTSD where you just take the cues from the patient and it's more focused on maybe po you know, positive reframing, a lot of support, perhaps mindfulness, but not a revisiting of the trauma. Because if you revisit mm. the trauma during ketamine, or as people are coming out of the infusion, and I'd be very interested in what um, Jerry has to say as well, um, it might worsen, it might be counterproductive. And it, this it, one is just a one study that appeared sure. blocking sure. reconsolidation. Yeah. Time, time, timing may be critical and that's yeah. really important. There, I see two hands and, and Vlad Matremsky has been holding up in his hand already for a while and then and then we go to Natalie, Natalie Maximetz, who also has a question. Um, and Vlad, please go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Prima, for your lecture. Uh, it was a so pleasure. Where are you to calling you. from, Vlad? Where, where uh, are you calling from? I am from Kiev. I am a yeah, medical doctor, PhD. I am founder and head of the first in Ukraine ketamine clinic. Wow. We are working since 2018. And so far we we have uh, more than 500 sessions done, more, mostly for resistant depression, uh, uh, anxiety, and uh, psychosomatic issues. And um, uh, now this uh, last year, we started more and more working with PTSD and uh, hopefully we'll have also good result with it. And um, actually, uh, I would like to answer to Adriana question about uh, the usage of ketamine in Ukraine. We uh, exactly the same, we're using it as off-label. 
uh, Ministry of Health allowed us to use uh, foreign uh, protocols. So this gave us possibility to work with, uh, with ketamine therapy. And um, also uh, I can confirm that the psychotherapy uh, combined with uh, the ketamine therapy is much more effective. May we use mostly uh, transpersonal and uh, I would say Jungian approach. So we work in with active uh, metaphoric symbolic therapy. And uh, actually uh, it gives very good effect also in any kind of traumatic issues. Right now we have uh, in treatment uh, the military with a, a very strong re uh, pharmacy resistant PTSD, which uh, actually a lost hope for any kind of help that can be achieved. And uh, he is actually after three sessions, he said that his life has uh, changed. And so hopefully that we can do this thank, one more. Thank, this you, thank you for that comment, uh, Vlad. Um, um, I'm, I'm aware that we're running a little bit out of time, but I want to give also the opportunity for Natalie, who's becoming a friend. I know she's from Amsterdam and she uh, she's working with Irina. We, we, we're getting to know you, Natalie. Great that you're with us again. You have a question as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm happy to be here again. Uh, I was actually wondering um, uh, whether there was the studies uh, of comparing uh, the effect of ketamine to the effects of uh, psilocybin and especially on trauma uh, because um, when you use psilocybin uh, it is possible to revisit the traumatic experience relieve the suppressed emotions and it's uh, it creates a therapeutic effect is it possible with ketamine and w which studies uh, could um, provide a comparison of those two substances? Thank you very much. Sure, um, that's an excellent question. <clears throat> so psilocybin so far has mostly been studied in you know, depression and also terminal cancer patients with depression. Our um, uh, Eric's colleague and my colleague, uh, Rachel Yehuda, has now started a study of uh, psilocybin for PTSD. So there's a lot of hope there. Um, it, it, uh, psilocybin like MDMA, uh, it, it induces more of an intense experience, although ketamine can in a subset of patients, and it might be dose dependent. They haven't been compared head to head, uh, but we see some patients on ketamine not have much dissociative, minor, and some people have intense experiences, very, um, symbolic about, being put in a cage by the abuser and then they come out and they, some of them have an insight even before therapy. So it, it's very good question. It's a lot of study ahead. Yeah. So what the takeaway and then, and then we, we return to Yuri um, um, uh, for, for his present. The takeaway that I get, um, uh, Adriana, is also, of course, dosing is really important, but timing is also very important. So in this kind of second generation psychopharmacotherapy, these 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 parameters have an importance to the therapeutic outcome. And I'm glad you, you your last study really underlines that, that the timing of doing any intervention, if it is exposure therapy or so in conjunction with the therapy, may may really matter. It may strengthen yeah, the, the, I mean, the may... type of therapy, the timing that's so important. I want to again clarify. This was not ketamine-assisted exposure therapy. I would not do that. It's basically the therapy is done on a different day, uh, not when they're acutely under the influence right. of ketamine. No, right. But in another in another um, um, period than the ketamine assist than the ketamine itself. Yeah. So there's another pot a lot of potential of ketamine-assisted therapy, which is a different type of study, and it's being also in depression, it's being done. So, yeah. All right. Well, that, that brings us probably to Yiri, who will help us to understand what that may be all about. And and the beauty of, of Yiri, not only that he's a wonderful person and, and um, has done so much important work, he just recently visited Kiev uh, on, a, on a delegation uh, that went to uh, to Kiev. And I, I would like him to comment on that as well. 
Uh, thank you very much for introducing me and for inviting me for this beautiful and very interesting session. Thanks, Adriana, for uh, the previous talk. It was very inspiring, and it, I think that it will complement uh, I'll, I'll complement uh, the, the topic from different uh, different different angle. So, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I work at the National Institute of Mental Health in, in Czech Republic and Charles University. Uh, but today, uh, I'll also talk on behalf of Sion Clinic, which is the first, uh, which is the first clinic oriented directly on psychedelic psychotherapy, and which we established in Prague or founded in Prague uh, several years ago. And uh, we conduct uh, different trials on different psychedelics, including DMT, psilocybin, uh, and of course, clinically, we are mostly oriented on ketamine. Uh, we also uh, received the, 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 the insurance uh, coverage uh, for the ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. So my angle view is a little bit different than the Adriana because uh, our, orienta our orientation is uh, to highlight and to utilize maximally uh, the psychedelic or psychomimetic or dissociative effect. It doesn't matter which term we, we can we use uh, in case in, of all psychedelics, including, uh, including uh, ketamine. The ketamine, uh, ketamine man. Uh, we, be uh, we began uh, with the with the. So uh, I came months ago from the from the Ukraine. Uh, I was there on visit on, on behalf of Minister of Foreign Affairs of Czech Republic, uh, and my uh, visit or my, my my traveling there was dedicated to ident to identification of some possibilities how Czech Republic could help. Ukrainian colleagues uh, in psychiat in the field of psychiatry and general the mental health. So I visited all hospitals in Lviv, uh, specifically oriented on, on, on amputation and burns. Uh, and I also uh, in, uh, I visited many, many clinics uh, and hospitals in, uh, in Kiev, including Lisova Polyona uh, rehabilitation centers uh, for mental, uh, mental health uh, of, for veterans. So uh, this uh, visit was extremely important. Uh, so it was very inspiring for me, and uh, it was fascinating how the Ukrainian colleagues are fighting not only against Russians but also uh, this is a trauma-related uh, problems, which are which amounts is uh, enormous uh, and it's uh, under understandable. So uh, I work in 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 Prague specifically uh, in psychedelic research uh, for more than twenty years. Uh, we began with the with the animal studies. Then we moved to, to the to the to the human studies in healthy volunteers. Uh, we have proven some some electrophysiological changes in in, in brain related to the subanesthetic dose of ketamine, which should be implications for antidepressant effect. Uh, it was uh, it was here after the Berman uh, Berman published uh, his pivotal study on on the on the fast antidepressant effect uh, of uh, of ketamine. Uh, recently, uh, we moved to more clinically oriented uh, oriented study uh, of ketamine uh, in unipolar unipolar depression. Uh, we uh, conducted several several projects uh, on predictors uh, of uh, fast antidepressant effect of uh, of, uh, of ketamine, and recently we also confirmed uh, that the benzodiazepines completely block uh, the antidepressant antidepressant effect due to the interaction interaction on paraphalbumin receptors uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in humans. Uh, during the recent time, uh, we tried to widen uh, the indications for uh, for uh, psychedelics, including including ketamine. We participated in the in the in the multicenter study. We just proven uh, the effect of psilocybin in treatment resistant uh, depression, and uh, now we are opening uh, the new research. A new research field specifically for the for the for, for the PTSD. Why? Because it's highly actual, and uh, and uh, Ukrainian colleagues, uh, but also the, the other countries and where are suffering uh, from increase of uh, trauma related uh, trauma related problems. So uh, I do not want to repeat what was what has been mentioned uh, before, uh, but what's important is. Uh, for the ketamine, uh, that uh, in PTSD there is a high level of comorbidity, comorbidity depression. Up to fifty percent of patients suffering from PTSD uh, have uh, comorbid depression. That's important because uh, ketamine is the antidepressant, uh, antidepressant uh, agent. Uh, the treatment possibilities for PTSD are still limited. We have SSRIs, 
and we have uh, some specific psychotherapies. Most of them are based on CBT, uh, CBT, CBT approach. Speaking about uh, CBT, uh, there are specific uh, specific uh, CBT approaches uh, focused on, on, on trauma or, uh, or, or PTSD, uh, including new forms of CBT, uh, such as uh, prolonged exposure therapy, brief eclectic psychotherapy, or cognitive restructuring. Uh, these uh, CBT therapies uh, have very good, uh, very good uh, evidence, uh, but the problem uh, is uh, that uh, they need the training and they are also lasting some time to, to, to reach the, it, it, it takes some time to, to reach the clinical, the clinical effect. The alternative, uh, which is, uh, I think, for the current situation in, in Ukraine, uh, quite more feasible, uh, is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Uh, EMDR uh, approach, which, as I know, and which I heard from people uh, in Ukraine, is now quite uh, popular, specifically among uh, younger clinicians. Uh, there, uh, this uh, psychotherapy is uh, also, was also inspired by cognitive or cognitive behavioral uh, psychotherapy. It was developed by uh, Francis Shapiro in, in 19s, and it's based on several 6 to 15 sessions, uh, uh, which uh, in eight steps uh, try to reprocess uh, the traumatic uh, traumatic memories and to replace them uh, by the positive cognitive uh, cognitive installation. Uh, according to me, the EMDR is quite uh, quite promising uh, approach, specifically for the conditions uh, in in Ukraine, because uh, by PTSD or trauma, there suffers thousands of <coughs> thousands of people, and theoretically, uh, EMDR psychotherapy could be could be also self administered. So uh, my talk will be much more practical than the, than the, than the, than the, than the, than the previous one. Uh, the EMDR uh, therapy uh, has some, some, some evidence also related to the, to the, to the brain, brain changes. And uh, it was documented uh, that EMDR, a very successful uh, change activity in the, in the brain regions, which are specifically uh, related to the, to, the, to, the, to the pathophysiology of, uh, of, uh, of uh, PTSD. The question is, uh, what's, what's more effective, CBT or EMD, uh, EMDR? Uh, one year ago, there was published a quite interesting meta-analysis, uh, which, uh, which summarized uh, the head-to-head -head studies comparing CBT uh, and uh, EMDR, and here are the, the findings uh, from this uh, meta-analysis first. Uh, Post-treatment, so immediately uh, after CBT or uh, CBT or EMDR, uh, the, PT, uh, the clinical effect on PTSD symptoms is, uh, is, the, is the same uh, in both, uh, both, uh, both possibilities. But uh, in PTSD-related uh, depression and in PTSD-related anxiety, this, this, uh, these symptoms quite often uh, accompany uh, the true or the clear uh, PTSD. EMDR uh, seems uh, or has to be proven to be statistically more significant. Uh, after three months of follow-up, EMDR is uh, both according to this meta-analysis as effective uh, as, uh, as, uh, as CBT. So uh, the psychedelic assisted Psychotherapy is the is the unique combination of the normal standard uh, psychotherapeutic uh, approach uh, with uh, one or more administration of some some psychedelics. Uh, speaking about psychedelics, uh, these drug uh, these drugs uh, differs uh, according to its chemistry and mechanism of uh, action, and uh, we can simplify it uh, that psychedelics uh, can be uh, can be uh, can be classified as serotonergic agents like psilocybin, uh, DMT, uh, LSD. Uh, etc. Uh, and NMDA, NMDA antagonists. NMDA antagonists, specifically the ketamine, uh, shares with uh, the true serotonergic psychedelics uh, some some aspects of the of the of the of the clinical effect and the, and, the, and the phenomenology. And it's not so not so surprising because both uh, NMDA antagonists uh, and true uh, psychedelics uh, differs in in the in the in the receptors uh, when they start. Yeah, its effect, uh, but uh, then, but later they overlaps in the downstream cascade on glutamate release and agonization of uh, of AMPA, AMPA receptors and and uh, and uh, the intracellular cascades related to the to the to the neuroplastic effect mentioned by 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 Adrena. Uh, 
apart stands uh, the MDMA, which is a little bit different than the, than the two, two hallucinogens. And today I will not talk about, uh, about MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD because uh, you are familiar with this and uh, Eric, I believe, talked about this uh, before. So today we'll orient only on, 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 on ketamine. Speaking about comparing ketamine and uh, normal serotonergic uh, psychedelics, uh, they share not only not only the the, the, met, the the molecular effect in the downstream metabolic cascades, maybe I'll talk too quickly, so sorry. Uh, but also also some 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 brain imaging signature as documented by Franz Bohlenweiler from Switzerland uh, by PET, and it was several times repeated. So uh, both classical psychedelics and ketamine uh, share the, the fast antidepressant and antidepressant uh, effect recently well proven, which is uh, probably uh, uh, related to the to the neuroplastic effect. Uh, in other words, immediately after administration of psilocybine or, or or ketamine, there is rapid increase in synaptic density in some specific uh, in some specific uh, brain regions. And this uh, this mechanism probably is responsible for uh, the the fast acting uh, antidepressant antidepressant effect. Comparing psilocybin as the most intensively studied drug uh, in the world and in the Czech Republic as well, uh, and uh, ketamine, uh, it seems uh, that uh, ketamine and psilocybin. Uh, share uh, the rapid onset of the antidepressant effect. It means in the, on the day of administration or the other day, uh, but uh, the effect of ketamine is limited up to seven days uh, and effect of uh, psilocybin is, uh, is, uh, is longer uh, up, to, up, to, up to three months. So speaking about true or normal depression, psilocybin uh, probably in future uh, would be more beneficial before because the re-administration uh, could be could be uh, uh, after each each three months, not or two months or three months, uh, not uh, not every week like in ketamine or spravato uh, as uh, as uh, as ketamine. However, however, uh, it is uh, it is unlikely that uh, the, the 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 poor uh, that the poor uh, neuroplastic effect relates to the to the to the to the clinical to the clinical effect. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2013, we published uh, the, the first study, uh, which documented that the, that the intensity of psychomimetic or psychedelic or dissociative effect uh, of uh, ketamine uh, relates uh, the antidepressant the antidepressant effect. In other words, the more quality uh, is the intoxication in terms of phenomenology and induced uh, symptoms, the better outcome after 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 seven after seven days. Uh, this finding was rapidly replicated by, by other, other 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 groups, and uh, it implicates many things. Uh, first, uh, we should care about the patients during the intoxication uh, and deal in a proper way uh, with, the, with the with the with the mental state. Uh, play good music at, and uh, communicate with them at, uh, and cope uh, in the standard psychedelic way uh, with people uh, on ketamine. Uh, and the second, uh, which is which is provocative and speculative, may be uh, the intensity of the psychotomimetic effect uh, relates to the to the to the ongoing uh, neuroplastic uh, neuroplastic changes in the brain during the intoxication. So that's that's the that's the speculative implication of this of this uh, of this paper. So, uh, speaking about uh, ketamine in PTSD, is there some is there some evidence? So, I do not want to repeat uh, Adriana's uh, Adriana's uh, Adriana's thoughts, and uh, but I want uh, and here is the list of of uh, all all uh, studies on, on on PTSD. So, what's uh, for me quite important is uh, that there is only limited number of combi of studies which combined psychotherapy. Any psychotherapy uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this ketamine. Quite interesting study is the is the Paradhans uh, one published in 2018, uh, which uh, documented that if ketamine is combined uh, with two sessions uh, of 10 minutes of top of 10 minutes uh, mindfulness based psychotherapy, the effect uh, on uh, on uh, PTSD uh, is much more longer uh, than uh, without the, 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 the psychotherapy than without without uh, without, uh, without ketamine. So that ketamine is able to prolong the effect uh, the, the, the 
the psycho psychotherapeutic effect uh, almost almost twice. So that's 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 the that's the study which inspired my to prepare the protocol or some proposal to be discussed today, uh, specifically for the Ukrainian uh, conditions. So, uh, in general, how can we combine uh, ketamine or other uh, uh, subst other other substances? Uh, this psychedelic or psychotherapeutic properties uh, with psychotherapy. There are, in general, three possibilities and three approaches. Uh, the first one uh, is called the psycholytic psychotherapy. The the diameter of the of the blue circles on this uh, on this slide symbolically represents uh, the the stress which uh, in in psychotherapy we put on the phenomenology on the on the symptoms which are induced during the, the, the intoxication. So that's, that's, that's the point, just to, just to elucidate it. So uh, there are the, the possibilities. So first is the so-called psycholytic psychotherapy. Uh, that's uh, psychotherapy inspired, uh, which was quite popular in, 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 in the 60s. And that's the combination of the standard psychodynamic psychotherapy, typically psychoanalysis with one or few intoxications. Uh, which uh, are used to leverage uh, the, the, the psychotherapy by uh, showing some or, or elucidating some or using some uh, unconscious uh, symptoms and and and, and etc. Uh, the true psycholytic psychotherapy is not very popular now in the in the world. It's not it's not often used, uh, but it's still used in Switzerland because in Switzerland there the tradition of psychedelic research. Uh, was has not been uh, interrupted like in the rest of the of the world. So this is one approach. The second approach, which is now the most popular and used typically in 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 studies on depression, uh, is uh, called psychedelic psychotherapy, and uh, it means uh, that uh, uh, in this psychotherapy, the psychotherapy is in general shorter, typically several weeks. Uh, and uh, the, the intoxication is highlighted by the psychotherapy of stress and facilitated. And we interpret and deal with this and play music for the patients, etc. So that's the psychedelic psychotherapy uh, based on the assumption uh, that the intoxication matters first and uh, that the intoxication itself could reactivate. Uh, could reactivate uh, the, 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 the mindset and help to release uh, the depressive or other, other symptoms. The third approach uh, is uh, called plasticity-oriented psychotherapy. That, that was what uh, Adriana taught, I think so. And this approach, uh, or mainly, uh, is based on the assumption that the intoxication uh, or in this uh, approach, intoxication serves only for induction of the neuroplastic plastic changes. So uh, the idea is uh, apply ketamine or psilocybin, induce the neuroplastic changes. It will open us uh, the window of opportunity uh, uh, lasting, let's say, seven days in case of ketamine or up to three months in case of uh, in psilocybin. And during that window, apply the psychotherapy, for example, cognitive uh, CBT, uh, because uh, theoretically, during that window, the psychotherapy uh, should, work, uh, should work better because uh, the neuroplasticity is induced. So let's deal with this, with this, uh, with this window. The truth is uh, that plasticity-oriented psychotherapy is not well utilized yet, uh, but I guess uh, I agree with Adriana that it would be would, would be quite quite popular. So I also agree with Adriana uh, that it's not uh, not not. Not, not, not good to to uh, to recall the traumatic memories during the intoxication, and neither when we work with ket with psilocybin or ketamine in PTSD patients, we do not induce it during the intoxication. So we let the intoxication to run smoothly uh, to have a good trip, uh, but uh, then we interpret it, uh, the, these symptoms that are the, the, the rules for standard psychedelic uh, psychotherapy. So. Uh, so that's, uh, that's 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 my proposal or that's my idea which pop up uh, in my mind uh, during my visit of Ukraine. How could uh, we help? So that's 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 the that's the idea. So the background uh, is uh, to provide the fast treatment, which is easily administ uh, with easy administration, even in the field condition. For example, in for for soldiers or people who 
uh, war, 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 zone, war zones. Uh, it should be operationalized. Uh, the procedure would be simple and uh, available also for less experienced clinicians. Specifically in psychedelic uh, psychotherapy, uh, it needs the quite experienced psychotherapists who are in addition trained in psychedelic uh, psychedelic uh, work, etc. So it's, it's 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 not feasible now for for Ukraine. So the the, the operationalized uh, treatment could be could be I think uh, effective. Uh, the this minimal uh, minimal needs for the for the clinical uh, clinical cl clinic additional clinical training and of course it should be safe and evidence based so that's my basic idea uh, let's uh, combine ketamine applied uh, uh, administered in the standard dose intravenously as we do it in Prague or in New York that's so that's or theoretically we, we, we could uh, administer it also uh, intramuscular and let's approximate those. Uh, 100 milligrams is uh, the phenomenology is the same like uh, 0 0.5 milligrams uh, intravenously administered in 30 minutes the, 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 no differences are there uh, or theoretically it's also possible to apply it uh, orally uh, like in the psychedelics clinics in 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 us they apply it orally or sublingually or nasally we could combine it uh, this uh, emdr uh, to this end uh, we are now working on PC version for EMDR uh, psychotherapy, which could be uh, quite easily administered uh, to, any, to, to, to anybody by PC or even by mobile mobile application. And uh, third point uh, is to combine both uh, psycholytic and plasticity oriented uh, psychotherapy, just to just to uh, do our best uh, to ameliorate the, the treatment related symptoms in Ukrainian people. So and that's that's uh, that's the that's the that's the that's the, that's the possible possible design which is uh, for discussion of course I'm not expert specifically in PTSD more in depression. Yuri, could you say something? Sorry to intervene. Yeah. Could you say something about the frequency? Adriana said twice or three times per week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, or where are you going to yes, come? Yes, there? Eric, uh, it's uh, excellent question. So, but it's open for discussion yeah, because uh, I don't know uh, my idea for the for the for the. Pilot study uh, is uh, that the best thing would be to administer it only once, just to just to confirm that uh, the EMDR is more effective when combined with ketamine than without ketamine. So that's that that, that that's the beginning for research, uh, but for clinical clinical uh, conditions. So it's uh, according the the needs for the for for the patients. We also some uh, the idea uh, of our ketamine assisted psychotherapy is uh, to do the best uh, to utilize the first intoxication with ketamine why because the first ketamine administration is related with the strongest wow effect uh, and uh, i want uh, uh, or my my, uh, my intention is to uh, to inspire the, the, the clinicians the psychotherapists to do a lot uh, the, the most of the work during after the first and if it is not needed, so do not repeat the ketamine. So that's that's my that's that, that's the idea, which we do, for example, in the Sion Clinic in, in, in Prague. So majority of patients uh, are in normal standard psychotherapy. We then apply once uh, the ketamine in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a proper in a proper psychotherapeutic way, and uh, then we try to prolong the, the effect forever. So that's 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 the idea. But theoretically, it's possible to to, to repeat it. Yeah. But uh, we need uh, to to combine the psychotherapy. So we can combine it with both the psychedelic uh, oriented approach and plasticity oriented approach. Uh, the psychedelic oriented approach, as we have good experiences in ketamine here, is cons consists of two preparatory sessions uh, when we uh, deal with symptoms, uh, we deal with intention uh, of, of, by the of, of the patient during uh, the intoxication then we apply ketamine with good music good session facilitated by, by, by music and then, then we continue this three integration session so we call this model two one three two plus one plus plus three two preparatory three integrations and one one ketamine session uh, in be, in between so that's the that's the that's the psychedelic psychotherapy uh, in our case, uh, it's operationalized, so we have the manual for, for therapists, and they follow uh, some, some rules, what, uh, what are the topics to talk during the first, during the se second preparatory session, etc. So I can share it with this, uh, this, uh, this anybody. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's that, that's the possibility. The second line uh, could be the plasticity-oriented psychotherapy uh, with the EMDR. EMDR is normally administered uh, from three sessions to, to 15, 15 sessions, but six sessions is the is the minimum. One EMDR session lasts approximately uh, one hour, but it needs uh, but it needs the experienced clinician. In our case, uh, we, de we developed uh, the EMDR program, the application, which is uh, possible to, to be administered by the patient itself. But for the purpose of the, of the study, it could be under control of, of, of somebody. So EMDR, uh, PC version, uh, 6 to 15 sessions uh, how many, uh, lasting, and the entire uh, treatment would last according to the protocols of EMDR. Uh, no, typically it lasts four weeks, but theoretically we can try uh, to shorten it up to up to one week. What we need in Ukraine is fast treatment. Yeah? Specifically in Lviv, uh, there are the, 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 the volunteers after amputations with, with, with burns, but after amputation on the prosthetic clinics, they stay, uh, these veterans stay seven days uh, in the in the in the prosthetic clinics, and this seven days is the window uh, when we can uh, work with them. So that, that's why I speculate that maybe we could shorten uh, the duration of the, of the treatment. So, uh, and EMDR needs, it's CBT based, so it needs, of course, uh, the measurement. So the simplified version, uh, which I, I offer, uh, is to utilize the intensity of PTSD symptoms simply by PTSD checklist for DSM-5. It consists of 20, 20 items and it could be used uh, as, the, as the psychometric scale, of course, and to administer it before the treatment, after, after three uh, EMDR sessions and after, after, after six EMDR sessions and at the, at the end. So that's, that's the protocol I want to discuss uh, with, you, uh, with you today. So uh, what's current status on my side or on our side? So we are already uh, establishing the cooperation. I'm glad that I can, that today I can see here my friends, uh, Lesia, Sak, etc. So we are establishing the cooperation. We are signing the memorandums of understanding and do this, do this uh, paperwork. And we are also searching for other partners from, from Ukraine. So I'm open. Uh, my institute and together with Czech Technical University, uh, we already prepared. Uh, the first prototype uh, of EMDR uh, application. Uh, it's free, it's open, and it's to be shared with, uh, with you. So that's why we, why we, prepared, why we prepared it. Uh, the EMDR for, th that's for, for therapists. Uh, EMDR for self-administration, it's a little bit more complicated. It's also almost ready. It consists of eight steps, the, the, the standard, and now we are working on translation to Ukrainian language, and we can try to, to test it and obtain some uh, first uh, first experience. We are also ready to share the, com the full methodology uh, of the psychedelic part uh, of the ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, consisting of two preparatory sessions, one intoxication and three uh, integrations, and we can train colleagues uh, from, from Ukraine if, if, if needed or it's, it's, it is attractive for you. So uh, as the ne next step, I think that we could modify the protocol uh, according to your specific uh, needs uh, and uh, somehow to in, in improve it. Uh, my plan is to start in this year the testing of EMDR uh, self-administration uh, uh, PC or mobile version in Czech Republic and in Ukraine uh, together obtain some pilot data and start some joint research projects, uh, controlled trials and obtain fundings from EU uh, specific like Horizon Europe and other uh, other other, poss uh, other possibilities. So that's that's from me. So if you want, please write me an email and I can share with you uh, most application, most of the program and anything we can start to collaborate well yeah collaborate that is a buzzword that's really important that thank you so much you you, you where's that picture taken it's from kiev it's from kiev oh, that's in kiev yeah, it's my done it's my done it's my done <laughs> but just, so, for fun. It's just for fun thank you so much for the um the but it's not fun of course uh, sorry sorry super exciting exciting talk which is complementary to adriana's and you you kind of you kind of anticipated how and that was the question that you also answered partially or maybe more than that 
how how this approach could be um, could be interwoven into the the landscape currently in in the, in Ukraine. And, and I have little doubt that this will uh, incentivize uh, many of the of, of us here on the call and and raise some questions. And if I may invite the first question to to Adriana to comment on the things that that um, that you um, you heard, Adriana, may, may I invite you to reflect on on some of the things that you heard from Yuri? And you want to comment or, or or ask a question about it, Adriana? Yes, I um so um. Yuri, just uh, again, could you say again the timing between? So I understand the um, when you do EMDR, what is the timing of the EMDR session with respect to the ketamine infusion? Yeah, uh, the timing. So my idea, we do not do it yet, of course. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. because because it's just yeah, just yeah, just another. But, but we have we have the EMDR and we have ketamine. So. Uh, my idea was uh, was uh, to apply as much as possible EMDR sessions during the first week after the after the uh, after the uh, after the ketamine in infusion. So that's that, that's the that's that's the basic basic idea. But EMDR needs uh, sure. the, the, the 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 patients to be prepared for the next session they have to integrate it. And I do not have any experiences. Uh, yeah. It's possible to to administer on a daily basis. So that's that's what I think we we we, would te we should test. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we, you we, mean we starting, so we need, we need starting seven, at least twenty four hours later or after the infusion? Yes, yes, the next day, the second day. The next the day. day start, yeah, no, I just start. wanted to comment. So my colleague, who you might know, Ilan Harpas Rotem, uh, he's based at Yale. He conducted. Um, a randomized, it was a small randomized controlled trial of one single infusion of ketamine and followed by several sessions of prolonged exposure uh -huh. compared to one single infusion of midazolam followed by several uh, also prolonged exposure. Um, and also started not during the infusion. And he, it was about 10 or 10 and 10 participants or maybe 15 and 15, he hasn't published yet, but he's presented at conferences and he didn't find any difference with one single infusion because so many sessions of PE, you might perhaps with EMDR, it would be an initial feasibility trial, but if you do administer a lot of EMDR and uh, you compare it to you know, saline or something, if, I mean, this would be open label. So you. He found that both groups responded very well, whether they got, because, you know, a lot of prolonged exposure compared to one infusion. So whether it was ketamine or midazolam, it, it worked. Um, but also he had MRI scans at baseline at 30 days and 90 days. And he did find a difference in the ketamine group um, in the amygdala circuitry compared to midazolam, suggesting that you know, after the combined treatment, suggesting that maybe there's a difference, but he's now going to, he's applied, and I think he might be funded for a larger randomized controlled trial of repeated ketamine with prolonged exposure uh, by the NIMH. So that'll be important. Um, what I would say again is that if you do an open label trial uh, with EMDR several sessions, I agree that, well, you want to wait a little bit, not administer like you said, the day off because of the issue of making memory, traumatic memory worse, but you might find that uh, it, you know, think about what your comparator would be. Like in my open label trial with written exposure therapy, we had a repeated ketamine alone in the past study. And then we also um, know the published studies of repeated, uh, of wet, non-inferiority written exposure therapy compared to CPT. So I would think of an analogous trial of EMDR alone. And also, is there one that has, well, at whichever frequency. Yeah. Um, I think that as an initial study, it's wonderful. And it's great that you're doing this, that you're planning this. And then I think it'll give you very preliminary information and then a randomized control trial comparing it with, let's say, saline plus EMDR or then more than one infusion would be important. Uh, but it's very exciting that, that you're doing this. If I may, so Vlad, 
Matrinsky, Matrinitsky, right? You run a clinic in Kiev. Do you see what Yuri just said? Sorry to intervene, but that may be a question that you also may be able to address. The, the, the addiction uh, component to ketamine in the Ukrainian situation that Yuri just uh, addressed. Well, uh, some customers, some clients who, who comes to me, they have already experience uh, of recreational usage of ketamine. But uh, usually when we do psychotherapy assisted sessions, they, they almost all admit that it's a totally different experience. That it have a really uh, therapeutic effect. And uh, I never heard from any of them that they started to use ketamine afterwards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. because they uh, understand what is the difference. And um, uh, from my experience, there was not any kind of addiction. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, um, we have a few minutes. I feel that there is some um, some appetite for a little bit of a, a, a Q and A. Um, and I see a hand, and I see quite some traffic in the chat, which is wonderful to see that you're chatting away. And we have some shared uh, Zoom links. We have some papers that are shared. So please, um, thank you for all that. Um, Ala Ala Proknovic. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in both prolonged exposure and EMDR, and I really appreciate uh, both of your excellent presentations. Where I know are you calling from, Alan? Oh, uh, New York. I'm actually also affiliated okay. with Mount Lovely. Sinai. Um, yeah. One of the contraindications for both P and EMDR has usually been act of trauma, but the situation in Ukraine is unfortunately ongoing. Um, so I was wondering, do you, do you both see of a way that maybe we can apply both the treatments with the psychedelics, but also the psychotherapies in cases where um, trauma might be continuous? It's a question first to Yuri and to Adriana, or you want to who? To, to both, I would say. Okay, Yuri, you want to go first? Uh, yes, the, the good, good question. I, I I don't know. So my. Former idea, maybe I'm naive in this because, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not expert in, in PTSD, uh, was uh, to offer uh, the, the, the the application uh, even in soldiers who are repeating now from the from the war zone. So I contacted the Red Cross, uh, you know, the you know, the guys who are transporting from the from the zero point zero to the to the first uh, medical medical uh, service and. Uh, it, it, it would be possible to, to to give them some leaves to the soldiers and if you think that you are traumatized so you can you can download uh, this application and start to start to do something with your traumatization uh, but uh, i don't know what, what's your opinion now so is it a good idea or not it would be possible it would, it would be possible so i try to do my best but maybe eric okay. is expert i i mean i oh sorry you, should i yeah, go ahead, Andrea. No, I wanted to say one. I mean, the first thing, it, it, these are very new directions, and there are no formally published randomized control trials of ketamine assisted psychotherapy, unlike MDMA assisted uh, psychotherapy, which now is in phase three. It is practiced in the community, there's a lot of experience clinically or quite a bit of experience, but there hasn't been a single randomized control trial. And so I think that any in any combination for PTSD or depression, any combination of any form of ketamine assisted therapy for PTSD or depression is experimental. It would be a research study. Um, now, there are uh, published results of ketamine alone, psychotherapy alone, EMDR alone. So there's a, there are established treatments. Uh, there are also, you know, anti uh, traditional antidepressants work for a subset of people. So we shouldn't end psycho traditional psychotherapy. Now, in terms of in the Ukraine, there are many people, I, I don't need to tell you, you all know, I've been following the news so closely and it's devastating um, and, and just the courage of, of Ukrainians. 
And I see a lot of different things. I see people who were in combat and now are back with their family. There are people who are refugees who have left. There are people who moved from one region in uh, Ukraine to another one. So there's a lot of opportunity. They're not, not everybody is undergoing active trauma. Uh, they, they're afraid. And of course it, it is generally active trauma. Everybody is, but there are changes from somebody who lost their home, lost relatives, was traumatized and maybe moved somewhere else where things are scary also, but, and very uncertain. So again, these studies, unfortunately were not done in a war zone. So it's just really hard to know, but it is possible to, especially, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, I would look to studies in Israel because in Israel, there's a constant threat or fear, very different from Ukraine, but studies done there, um, I know that uh, it might uh, even like review of how to conduct therapy in a, a region that is also threatened by war. I would look at publications, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but also it's possible, especially the acute trauma has passed a while ago and they're not under immediate threat. How to conduct psychotherapy or exposure therapy if someone is still in a region that's being bombarded and attacked every day? I mean, there really, you don't even need exposure. You don't do exposure therapy. You just do, well, try to protect your safety. You, you know, it, it, so it has to be for people that are removed somewhat from having been in combat or having lost family members or having lost a leg or a function, and now they're in recovery somewhere where it's somewhat quieter. So then you can provide some treatment and support or refugee somewhere else. So my question is, does ketamine create a strong hallucinogenic effects? And if so, are is this, if, are, is this addressed during the integration? And is there a correlation between the hallucinogenic effect from ketamine and increased neuroplasticity? Yeah, okay. um, two questions. Two questions, yes. Uh, the effect, <laughs> effect of ketamine uh, depends uh, depends uh, on uh, the dealing with this, the psychological, psychological dealing. Uh, the effect is quite intensive. Uh, and uh, in the inter in the general intensity measures, let's say, let's say by the Dietrich scale, altered states of consciousness, which he uses, that's the, that's the standard. So it's it's the, the intensity is the is the same. In uh, in fields of so-called oceanic bondlessness, so ego, ego resolution, completely, completely the same. In visual re reconstruction, it means the, the visual, the perceptual alterations like synesthesias, uh, pseudo, pseudo hallucinations, illusions, etc. It's less intensive uh, than than the than the than the psilocybin. Definitely less intensive and different in its iconography. Uh, in other words. Uh, the 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 effect of psilocybin uh, is more granular. It's more it's more fascinating. Uh, in case of ketamine, it's a little bit boring. Colors, shapes, mm -hmm. textures. Typically, textures. Yeah. It's something what's characteristic and what relates, of course, to the dissociated effect. How the brain is disconnected during the NMDA uh, receptors receptors blocking. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the the third parameter, it's so called dread of ego dissolution or the fear from ego dissolution or bad trip like uh, symptoms. Uh, ketamine is safer than uh, traditional hallucinogens, so less uh, bad trips, less uh, paranoid reactions. Uh, comparing with psilocybin, definitely it's it's safer. So it's easier to to, to deal with this uh, for beginners uh, like the, the psychedelic uh, research. But we deal it completely in the, in the same way, uh, and uh, and uh, and the effect is. I think that blood uh, does the same, uh, and the effect is very intensive, and it gives uh, you the material to, to be treated uh, during the integrated integration session. Yeah, it's it's possible to, to deal with this, but it's a little bit, little bit, little bit different. It was the first question. Uh, the second question was if uh, the uh, if the intensity of effect, like psychological effect, is related to the neuroplasticity. I do not know. We published one one study; it was replicated, and we know only that the antidepressant effect relates to the intensity of intoxication, the psychological. So the most likely uh, uh, interpretation is that it relates. That it relates. The more intensive 
uh, psychomimetic effect, specifically in case of ketamine, the more more synapses there. So, but it, it's not proven. Uh, we do not have. Uh, we have some EEG studies uh, which could confirm it, uh, but we did not do the the, the PET studies which could confirm it in humans. Uh, neither uh, nor nor uh, nor the nor the, nor the red uh, brain stainings, not, 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 not yet, because it's not possible to measure the psychology in red. So it's complicated uh, to 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 prove it if it is really uh, the neuroplasticity. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. I'd like to say thanks to Adriana and to Iji and to I'd like to say thanks to our interpreters. It's been a very complicated topic, lots of research, terminology, uh, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.